that is titled, We Have So Much to Be Thankful For. Don't we have a lot to be thankful for? Yes. Amen. But isn't that true? Um, starting next Sunday, I'm going to do a series that's titled Vast. And it's about the vastness, the enormity of the plan for God to become human. What would that entail? What would it require? How, how could God do this? How, how could He pull that off? The enormity of our universe, and, then, and yet special love for a privileged planet, and special love for a privileged nation, and the introduction of a Savior to the world who would be our rescuer, it's, it's vast, it's enormous. So I'm going to be sharing that next Sunday on November uh, 28th, and then on Sunday, December 5th, and Sunday, December 12th. Also, don't forget that on December 19th, our kids' Christmas play happens here. It's always a wonderful event. Um, I don't, I honestly, I don't know if they're doing the same play or not, but the highlight has always been when the king dies. We have a different king every year in the Christmas play, and they really do it upright. I mean, when they die, it's, uh, they roll around and make a big scene. They fall on the floor. And the, the new king always tries to top the old king. It's always, you know, tries to die a little better. But um, I, don't, I don't know if they're actually doing that storyline or not, but I'm telling you, the, um, the kids' Christmas play is always a hit. You definitely want to be here on, on Sunday the 19th. But the series that I'm doing vast, next Sunday the 28th, Sunday the 5th, and Sunday the 12th, and then I'll conclude that series with a special Christmas Eve service here at 5 p.m., December 24th. We invite you to come. Bring your family on December 24th. We're going to have communion together. It's going to be a, a one-hour service that is very meaningful. And I, I just really hope for you that, that it will fit into your schedule and your festivities um, as you're celebrating the birth of the Christ child. Um, I, I do want to point us to Thanksgiving this morning. And, and we do have so much to be thankful for, do we not? Yes. We are extremely blessed. And I want to say this as sort of a preface to this message, maybe even a, a disclaimer. If you find yourself in a season where you've been really, really challenged, if you have, especially if you have been experiencing suffering on any level, I truly want you to pay attention because I believe that God has a special message just for you. So pay attention closely. Both of my sons have experienced suffering on a deep level. Both Zach and Nick. And, um, and I'll bet your kids have too. Um, but for both of them, in different ways, extreme isolation, um, situations they didn't ask for. But when I think about it, here's what always comes to mind. I don't even know if I realized what I was praying, but over and over when they were little boys, I prayed, Father, whatever you do in my life, because you've blessed me so much, I feel like I've been extremely blessed. I know that Pastor Mo can relate to this. I sense that if I could just be half the man my dad was, wow, what an anointing on his life. But God has blessed me so much. And this is what I prayed when Zach and Nick were little boys. Father, would you put a double portion of anointing upon them? Let them have more influence and more impact than I have with my life. That's my prayer. Whatever I'm able to accomplish for the kingdom, be exponential in them. And I, maybe I didn't understand what I was praying and what it might require. Uh, I've noticed something important with Zach in particular, uh, his situation having been in prison now for seven years. And he had one-on-one -on -one time with his Papa Roberts like none of the other grandchildren had because of his situation. 
there was an incredible mentoring that took place around the metal tables in the prison meeting room for, for uh, more than five years and nearly six years that Paul Paul poured into his life. I noticed something really important though, the first 14 months of his imprisonment especially. God used those 14 months at 4th Avenue Jail and LBJ, Lower Buckeye Jail, those 14 months were especially hard. God used those 14 months to teach him something deep on a level of a theology of suffering that he could not have experienced any other way. In fact, he's the reason that I'm cheering from Isaiah 12 this morning and my apologies to the tech team, the reason that I was scrambling to get the notes and the slides to them right as service is starting because I had planned to go a completely different direction with this message. Um, I taught on Wednesday night about the book of 1 Thessalonians and, and how there's three times where Paul says, I'm thankful for something, and all three of them connect with the family of God. We, we had a beautiful time in here Wednesday night. As different ones were sharing just the family of God and, and how blessed it is and how thankfulness is proportionately connected to the family of God. Truly amazing. And so I really continue, I plan to continue that, um, that theme of first Thankalonians is what I called it. <laughs> but yesterday as we were visiting with Zach, I said to him, you know, I really miss the times when we had the Bibles here in the visitation room. We can't do it because... Um, of COVID, they don't want us all handling books together, and so I really miss those times when we would just open the Bible, and we would just say, hey, what's the Lord saying to you? And so yesterday I said, Zach, what's the Lord saying to you? And he said, well, I'm getting excited about our Thanksgiving worship service tomorrow night, tonight. Uh, there's about 20 men, they, they meet each Sunday night, they play CDs, and Zach's the worship leader, and they have incredible worship. And he said, on this night, we didn't really plan it this way, but it turned into a Thanksgiving feast. Each of us bought a little bit of rice or beans or something from the store, and one big guy is boiling it in a mop bucket. And we're excited about having chicken and rice together for our Thanksgiving feast at the worship time. And we're going to go around the room just tell them what we're thankful for. And then he said, and I'm, I'm going to teach from Isaiah 12. He said, I just happened to be reading Isaiah. And really, Isaiah 12 is, is a, a hymn of thanksgiving. And then last night as Pastor Oliver was preaching a beautiful message about thanksgiving, God spoke to my heart, yeah, I do want you to talk from Isaiah chapter 12. And so, um, so Zach's the reason that I'm going to be sharing that this morning. And, and um, here's, here's a scripture that I want to begin with. It's not the text, but it, it springboards us into the text, and it's a statement that was made by the writer of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 8. Even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience from the things He suffered. Did you just read that correctly? Jesus learned obedience from the things He suffered. I don't have any knowledge or understanding to offer you about this verse. All I can do is offer you the verse. Amen. Jesus learned obedience by suffering. And so, like I said at the beginning of this message, if you've been going through a season of suffering, don't be discouraged. L allow God to use this to shape and to fashion of what He wants to do in your life. If you're confused, if you've been feeling, I'm supposed to be blessed all the time. What's wrong with me? Other people seem to be blessed. I want to be blessed. You know, I sent in the love offering to the televangelist. He prayed over it. He said I was going to be blessed. I want to be blessed. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to be, I don't need to be I don't mean to be discouraging or, or sarcastic. I really don't. That's not my intent. But here's the thing. 
If you have fallen for the lie that says, if I'm a Christian, that means everything's rosy all the time. That means I need to drive the nicest car and live in the most beautiful home that I paid cash for. And I have to have the corner office. Let me be the one to share. I've got news for you. That's not the real world. Sometimes, sometimes you face suffering. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It doesn't mean you don't believe enough. And sometimes God will allow suffering. And when suffering happens, it's always for the purpose that we can be more productive and closer to the Lord. And so if you've fallen for the, the lie of current culture that says, I'm too blessed to be stressed, Welcome to real Christianity. It involves both in balance, and both of those things produce thanksgiving on our part. When I'm blessed or when I'm going through difficult times, I'm offering thanksgiving in the midst of my circumstances. Um, let me preface it this way too. Paul the Apostle, he knew what suffering was. Tradition says that Paul was beheaded because of his faith. That's how he died. John the Apostle, he knew what suffering was. Banished to an island. All by himself. Sent off into exile. Tradition tells us that most likely he died by being plunged into boiling oil. And I was thinking this morning as we were singing, he plunged me to victory. That's that was the precise wording I had planned to use for Paul. And I just thought, oh my goodness. Wow. His victory, his <laughs> ultimate victory. Amen. Praise God. He got plunged into burning oil, but he got plunged into the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and he went into eternity singing and triumphing on the other side. And, and so, Peter, the apostle, he knew what suffering was. In fact, tradition says that Peter didn't want to be crucified the same way as Jesus. He said, I'm not worthy. So turn me on this cross upside down. And they, they hung him upside down on the cross as he died. Think about the Old Testament prophets and some of the things they went through. Ezekiel, you know, even in his day, people thought he was weird. I, I would encourage you someday, just Google Ezekiel on, online and see what comes up. There are people that think that dude was tripping on LSD. He must have seen spaceships. I don't understand him. He's whack out of his mind. He doesn't belong in the Bible. No, no, no. He suffered because of the things that he experienced. A man who lived so close on that, that proximity of the line between the natural world and the spirit world. Jeremiah, he knew what suffering was. He sank down into the miry clay. They dropped him in a cistern and left him there to die. And somebody said, you better fish him out with a rope because he's not going to make it. And after many days, they pulled him with a rope, putting rags under his arms so it wouldn't burn him. And, and he gets pulled out of the, the very pit where he was thrown in. He knew what suffering was. Isaiah is the one I want to focus on this morning. Isaiah. He prophesied for more than 50 years, straddling the century mark, about 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. He was the Billy Graham of his day. Isaiah. He was the Billy Graham of his day. Billy Graham... Um, had had audience with six different presidents. What an amazing spiritual giant, a fixture of our day, to have six different presidents say, please, uh, can I consult with you? Can you give me advice? That's sort of how Isaiah was. He was an advisor to four different kings. Uzziah, Jotham, um, Ahab, Hezekiah, all of them wanted Isaiah to come and give advice. He was a prophet who not only used foretelling, but he used foretelling. Some prophets are foretelling. That is, 
They speak truth. They preach the truth for what's needed for a, for a situation. That's a gift of the prophetic, foretelling the ways of God. But Isaiah not only did that, he ministered foretelling. That is, 700 years in advance, he was prophesying things that would come to, to pass to the letter of, of his prophecy, to the nth degree. He prophesied of Jesus being born of a virgin. He prophesied that his name would be Emmanuel. He prophesied of Jesus' death on the cross. And he prophesied of a new heaven and a new earth. He prophesied, his prophecies, when I, when I think of Isaiah, it's kind of like you're standing and looking way off in the distance and you see a huge mountain range. And there's different peaks all along the way. And you can see that there's different peaks way, way out as far as the eye can see. That's sort of how Isaiah was. He was seeing things and understanding things and speaking things way ahead of time. And so he begins his ministry by seeing a vision. And Isaiah in the vision, he says, Woe is me. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Here am I, but I'm not even much. I'm not worthy to even be in your presence. Woe is me. But the angel takes the tongs and grabs coal from the sacrifice and touches his lips. And says, I have made you worthy. As he presents himself to the Lord. And, and then... God tells him up front, you're going to prophesy to people. And they're going to have hard, calloused hearts. They're not going to receive what you say to them. I mean, how, how would you like that for your assignment? For the next five decades, I want you to say what I'm going to say, and nobody's going to like it. And they're not going to receive it. They're going to harden their hearts. Oh yeah, Lord, sign me up, right? I mean, that was a hard thing. But he says, yes, Lord, I'll do exactly what you've called me to do. And so he did for 50 years. And, and here's the thing that he says. So ironic. This people, they honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Can you imagine what that felt like for Isaiah to write those words? They honor me with their lips. They do nothing but give lip service. They're not genuine. And remember that he started his ministry by saying, my lips are unclean. And God made him pure. But in case you have forgotten Isaiah, he knew what suffering was. For three years, Isaiah was banished from the norm. God told him, I want you to strip naked for three years, walk around as a symbol of what it's going to be like as a refugee. I mean, I'm trying to picture, you know, Pastor Mo and Pastor Oliver, they went before the Assembly of God Credentials Committee this last week. I think if Isaiah came in the room, there would be some serious questions. Isaiah. What were you thinking? God <laughs> told me to do it. And now the Hebrew word there, was he completely naked? Possibly. Maybe he wore a, a loin cloth or some type of diaper. But can you imagine just the embarrassment of a grown, respected, educated man stripping down? And for three years he walks around naked. And everyone said, what is wrong with Isaiah? What is he doing? Well, did you hear? He's saying this is a picture of what we're going to be like when we keep disobeying God. He knew what it was like to suffer. In fact, in the second century, Justin Martyr, who was, he's the one that we get that word from, martyr, when a Christian is killed because of their faith, they call them a martyr. That comes from the man named Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr said that Isaiah was the one that the writer of Hebrews was talking about uh, when he said, some 
have been sawed in two. Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter of faith, the greatest faith of all history. Justin Martyr, he's only 100 years removed from the events of the New Testament. He's 700 years after Isaiah, but at least in the first century. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but in the first century, Justin Martyr said, yeah, that's talking about Isaiah. Remember how he was solved in two. And so, this is the man who experienced suffering, and yet his prophecies are quoted more than any other Old Testament book in the New Testament, quoted more by Jesus than any of the other prophets, and, and used primarily as a guide for what we would understand about the Messiah. And so I want you to notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 12. It comes under the title, A Hymn of Thanksgiving. Follow along with me as I read verse 1. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Let those words sink in for a moment. I'm going to praise you, Lord. You were angry with me, but thank you. Your anger has turned away. That's heavy duty. I, I like the way it's worded in the uh, Good News translation. I praise you, Lord. You were angry with me, but now you comfort me and are no longer angry anymore. And so from the text this morning, we're going to read through these six verses of Isaiah 12. And I want to just point out, I want to bring out four different things to you. And they just fall naturally in line with this text. And so uh, he starts off by saying, oh, you were angry with me, but you're not angry anymore. Now you're comforting me. And here's the first thing I want to say. What was God so mad about? Why are you mad at Isaiah, God? What's going on? Well, it's not for Isaiah specifically. It's for the Jewish people. And it's not for the Jewish people specifically. But it is for all humanity. Have you ever read in the Bible about the wrath of God? Romans talks about it. How Jesus appeased the wrath of God with His perfect sacrifice. What were you so mad about, God? Here's what God's mad about. That He created us to worship Him, but over and over humanity snubbed to their noses at Him. And people have treated Him with such disrespect and such disdain and have practiced the most unholy things. And it has gone on and on for centuries and centuries and centuries. And so it's really hard for us from our vantage point to understand it. We see the wrath of God against sin. But what we have to understand is that God is perfect. God is holy. Sin cannot abide in the presence of a holy God. Houston, we have a problem. Humanity is filthy and sinful. What are we going to do? God has wrath to us. But because of Jesus' death on the cross, His perfect sacrifice, it appeased the wrath of God. And He is no longer angry with you and me. And so, verse 2 reads like this, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord Himself, the Lord, the Lord Himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. And again, to quote the Good News translation, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He has become my salvation. Um, so now, it's a beautiful thing when we're able to say, 
I will trust in you and not be afraid. That's, that's what this says. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. We should be afraid. We should be very afraid. Because as Jonathan Edwards preached, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. They say that there were claw marks on the pews as he preached. People literally felt that they were falling into the abyss of hell, separated from a holy God. We should be very, very afraid. But thank goodness, he's not angry with you and me. And so therefore, I will trust and not be afraid. And like verse 3 says, with joy you will draw from the wells of salvation. So, here's the second point. Oh, I get it. We need a Savior. We, we need a Savior. It's not enough to just go through life willy-nilly, just being a good American and showing patriotism. And are you a Christian? Well, sure I am. I'm American, aren't I? We're a Christian nation. That used to be the case. I think that many people um, wrongly thought because we had such a great Christian influence in our nation that they were Christian. They don't have to worry anymore. Our nation for the last four decades has been so anti-God in all of its legislation that now you really stand out like a sore thumb if you say I'm a follower of Jesus and I live for Him. And so, but here it is, verse 4, he says, In that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. And proclaim that He is exalted. Sing to the Lord. For He has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Here's the third observation. Wait. This isn't just for us. Make known what God has done to all the world. Let the news spread far and wide to all the world. You know, last Sunday, we focused on worldwide mission. Our campaign for 2022 is called City Reach. And it takes that name not because we only want to reach the city of Buckeye, but because of the strong conviction of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem. You, we could say in Buckeye. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. We could say in Buckeye, in Phoenix, in the Greater Valley. In, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so my conviction is that as the light is shining strong inside of us here in Buckeye, that we're going to not only reach our city, but we're going to reach our world. We're going to be part of this worldwide movement that says everybody needs to know about Jesus as quickly as possible. And so, um, here's what it's based upon. Two things, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. The Great Commission, Jesus says, go. It's in command form. Go therefore and baptize all nations preaching to all nations and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, baptizing them and surely I am with you even to the very end of the world. It was the last thing He said to His disciples before He went back to heaven to His Father. It's like He's leaving out of the driveway and He rolls down the window and He says, don't forget, go ye therefore into all the world. That's the great commission. We have been commissioned. That's the what the what is, what are we doing? We're going to go. But here's the how. The great commandment. Love one another, even as I have loved you. This is my commandment to you. So how do we do it? We do it by loving one another, loving our Lord, and going. And so if you didn't get the chance last week to fill out one of these cards, we call it our City Reach card. And we need every individual for the church family. You can do this all throughout the month of November. Pray about a dollar amount that God would have you give 
And uh, when you're ready, we've got these forms in the bag. I'll be happy to give you one. You just simply tear off this part to keep it as a reminder, and you turn this part in. You can give it to me or to Stephanie or to any of the leaders, and we'll make sure that your faith promise gets included for this year. I want to read that again, verse 4, and um, here's what it says. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He's done. Look at that, what He has done. Again, looking at Good News Translation, it says it this way, tell all the nations what He has done. What has He done? Well, this is the, the final and the fourth observation. Give thanks all the way through the season. Number four, give thanks all the way through the season. Don't let Thanksgiving just be a day where we enjoy some food and we get together and watch a little football, but let it be the beginning of a season that stretches all the way through Christmas. When you read here in Isaiah 12 what the Lord has done, there's an intricate connection of the plan of salvation, which he started back in chapter 7, and it mentions again in chapter 9, where he's talking about, for to us a son is given, for to us a child is born. Uh, when it speaks about he will be born of a virgin, this is the culmination. This is what he has done. This is what we're going to start talking about next Sunday, the vastness, the vastness of this God plan to introduce holy God into sinful humanity and rescue and redeem our planet. That's exactly what He has done. So don't let yourself be enticed by all of the commercialization and all of the... Um, yeah, I, look, I get it. I know that the, the stores all started playing Christmas music like three weeks before Thanksgiving. Okay, I get it. And I know why. And I kind of like it. It's, it's as though... Boy, we really, we really need to be extra thankful this year. We really need to appreciate what we enjoy. We didn't get to do all of this last year. I already said it. I think our house, we're going to watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life twice this year. We just, I, just, I feel like we need it. We just need George Bailey, you know. And, and, but don't, don't get distracted by all the stuff. Hey, if your neighborhood is participating in the City of Buckeye Lights contest and you've got the five houses, yeah, woohoo, way to go. But don't let it only be about that. There's so much more, more than the gifts that are under the tree, more than the food that we can enjoy, more than a little time off from work. Hallelujah, how wonderful is all of that. But there's this plan that God has executed. Give thanks all the way through. And so he ends it with this verse, and I won't put it on the screen, but let me just read verse number 6. He ends by saying, Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. We have so much to be thankful for. I want to encourage you to stand on your feet. Pastor Mo, would you come? And I, I want to worship for a moment. And then I would like to invite anyone who wants prayer because maybe you have been going through some of that suffering. If you've been going through suffering, I would love to lay hands on you and anoint you with oil and believe with you. So as our team comes and they, they're leading us, would you just, would you prepare your heart?